Welcome to the Watchman Channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I am asking that if you can, to please help to financially support this ministry. If you feel led to pledge any amount of money, it would be extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. There is a PayPal link in the description box and in my pinned comment below. You can also donate using Cash App. My cash tag is dollar sign watchman 1963 thank you all so much for your prayers and support god bless do you remember what things were like right before the 2020 election the fires were still smoldering from the summer of love major cities across the country boarded up to prepare for another round of democrat riots in case biden lost but joe biden won so the angry left stood down but now that trump's beating biden in the polls the angry left's predicting more violence this time, they say Trump will be a dictator, kill journalists, lock up gays, and never leave office. George Conway is predicting some kind of purge. And yes, there will be deprogrammings. If this guy's elected president, we're going to have civil disorder like you've never seen. 60, 70, well, 80 million people who will vote for the guy, and we still have to live with those people, and we're going to have to deprogram them at some point. Trump says his revenge will be success. Liberals say their revenge will be civil disorder and deprogrammings. Who's really inciting violence? And AOC says if Trump wins, she'll be sent to prison. I, it sounds nuts, but like, I wouldn't be surprised if this guy threw me in jail. <laughs> really? He's out of his mind. Mm -hmm. I mean, he did his whole first campaign around lock her up. Like, this is his motto. I take him at his word when he says that he's going to round up people. I take him at his word when he threatens journalists. If Donald Trump wins... We are looking at the potential dissolution of democracy in the United States of America. AOC is much more valuable to the Republican Party out of prison, speaking freely and sharing her brilliant insights with the country. Trust me. Michael Cohen says the Trump administration will shatter, but in a different way. And just like Putin, once you start to get too big for your own britches, people will start flying out of windows. They will start like Navalny. They will end up in gulags. They will end up, as Donald says all the time, send them to Gitmo. Send them to Guantanamo Bay. Joe Biden says he's running to save democracy. If Trump wins, America's over. An orange revolution will usher in a racist dictatorship, and the Constitution will be replaced with the art of the deal. Which raises the question, if Trump does win... Why would Biden concede? A new op-ed from The Hill wonders, what if it's Biden who refuses to leave the White House? While speaking with some Democratic friends, a reverse scenario was brought up, albeit mostly tongue-in-cheek. That scenario being that, what if, quite ironically, it was Biden who either postponed the election out of fear of MAGA unrest and rebellion, or simply refused to leave the White House upon losing in November? Makes sense. If Trump's Hitler and you lose to Hitler, why would you willingly hand Hitler the keys to the White House? Spiritual warfare is off the charts. Battle lines are being drawn and people are choosing sides. The United States is divided on just about every issue. Race, homosexuality, transgenderism, abortion, climate change, gun rights, and the list goes on. Jesus said that a kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation as we read in Matthew 12, 25. But Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against itself will not stand. Jesus tells us he is the reason behind the division we are seeing today, as we read in Luke 12, 51 through 53. Do you suppose that I came to give peace on earth? I tell you, not at all, but rather division. For from now on, five in one house will be divided, three against two, and two against three. Father will be divided against son, and son against father, mother against daughter, and daughter against mother, mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law, and daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Jesus then goes on to rebuke the multitudes for not knowing the time they were living in, as we read in Luke 12, 54 through 56. Then he also said to the multitudes, Whenever you see a cloud rising out of the west, immediately you say, a shower is coming, and so it is. And when you see the south wind blow, you say, there will be hot weather, and there is. Hypocrites, you can discern the face of the sky and of the earth, 
but how is it you do not discern this time? Jesus was rebuking the multitudes for not recognizing the times they were living in. Jesus, the promised Messiah, was standing right there before them, and they didn't even know it. If the multitudes of Jesus' day missed Jesus' first coming, how much more important is it for us today to discern the times we live in and make sure we don't miss the signs of his second coming? Jesus now goes on to tell a parable about his true followers and those who are not, as we read in Matthew 13, 24 through 30. Another parable he put forth to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, then the tares also appeared. So the servants of the owner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? He said to them, An enemy has done this. The servants said to him, Do you want us to then go and gather them up? But he said, No, lest while you gather up the tares, you also uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, First, gather together the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. Jesus went on to explain the parable of the wheat and tares, as we read in Matthew 13, 36 through 43. Then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house. And his disciples came to him, saying, Explain to us the parable of the tares of the field. He answered and said to them, He who sows the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world. The good seeds are the sons of the kingdom, but the tares are the sons of the wicked one. The enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are the angels. Therefore, as the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of this age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and those who practice lawlessness, and will cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their Father. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Those who genuinely follow Jesus are the wheat, and those who don't are the tares. I believe we are witnessing the wheat being separated from the tares. Are you a wheat or a tear? Former United States Assistant Secretary of the Treasury for Public Affairs, Monica Crowley, joins us now. Monica, do you think if Trump wins, Biden is going to go gracefully? Uh, well, I mean, it's an outstanding question, isn't it? And there are a lot of people who suspect that he might find some pretext not to leave mm. the presidency. Or I should be more accurate, Jesse, and say the people pulling his strings would like to stay in power. If someone is going to destroy the country and you lose, why would you say, OK, my transition team will be in touch and these are the passwords to the Eisenhower <laughs> executive building? Right? You wouldn't. Right. You wouldn't do that. So what do you yeah. think Joe's going to do? Is this is this a realistic scenario? Well, you know what's interesting about the left, Jesse, is that, you know, a lot of people are talking about projection, that they that's usually an unconscious thing where it's really a confession of what you yourself is doing, right. what your side is doing. You blame the other side or you accuse the other side of doing it. It's usually a tell, but it's usually, you know, an unconscious thing here, I think, is part of a deliberate strategy on the part of the left. They're lying to everybody about Donald Trump. They're lying to everybody about the right and conservatives when they themselves for decades have spent a lot of time and resources burning down the country, literally, whether it was the weather underground, Antifa, Black Lives Matter, now the pro-Hamas uh, protesters are out there. Remember, the issue is never the issue. The issue is always the revolution. So they're trying to turn Constant the conversation revolution. around right, to destabilize American society. So they're trying to turn the conversation around and flip the script and say Donald Trump and MAGA is going to do this. And they you know, say and he's going to deliver of, civil unrest if he's reelected. That's what they That's deliver. probably them, the resistance, colliding with people <laughs> and causing civil unrest. Because well, I'm not going to be deprogrammed peacefully.
The really important piece about this is, you know, knowing what we know the deep state and the left are capable of doing, they're not just going to allow Donald Trump to march back in. They're not just going to allow America first to come back right. in. So I think a lot of people are braced for something that the deep state, that the regime might have up their sleeve. They're capable of anything. We've seen that evidence very, very clearly. The evil we are seeing today isn't Republican versus Democrat, right versus left. It's good versus evil. There are only two groups of people in this world, the saved and the unsaved. Here's a question everyone needs to answer. Whether you are a Democrat, Republican, or not affiliated with either party, do you love Jesus? Many professing Christians say they love Jesus, but in all actuality, they hate him. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Many who profess to be Christ followers are pro-abortion, pro-homosexual, and pro-transgender. They are defiant to the laws of God, as we read in 1 John 3, 4. Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. How then can these people claim they love Jesus when he said, If you love me, keep my commandments. Jesus declares, They honor me with their lips but their heart is far from me, as we read in Matthew 15, 8 and 9. These people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me, and in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. For those who say Jesus never said anything about abortion, homosexuality, and transgenderism being a sin, the Bible tells us all scripture is inspired by God as we read in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Scripture has plenty of negative things to say about killing the innocent and homosexuality. It's called lawlessness. Many professing Christians justify sin by using Christ's commandment to love your neighbor as yourself. Loving your neighbor as yourself means telling them the truth in love, not by condoning their sin. The good news is, God will forgive all sin, as we read in 1 John 1 9. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Jesus said, as a sign of his coming and the end of the age, there would be an increase in deception, false Christ who will deceive many, wars and rumors of wars, nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom, famines, pestilences, earthquakes, Christian persecution, apostasy, false prophets, and lawlessness causing the love of many to grow cold. Jesus said all of these signs would come like birth pains. Jesus was likening last day's events to a woman in labor. As the labor progresses, the pains increase in both frequency and intensity until the baby finally comes. As we get closer to Jesus' return, all the signs he gave us as a sign of his coming and the end of the age will become more frequent and more intense. All of these signs are manifesting around the world in our time. It was a beautiful, somber setting in France to commemorate the 80th anniversary of D-Day today. The few remaining World War II vets on their final mission. The Biden team hoped that the president's remarks would resonate with voters back home, showcasing him as a Reagan-esque figure who would unite Americans and the rest of the world behind his vision. But the speech they wrote for him merely demonstrated how muddled, unserious, and unrealistic their thinking is. First, the Biden folks seem to think that they conv can convince us that Russia in Ukraine poses the same existential threat to the West as Germany did in 1944. We will not walk away. If we do, Ukraine will be subjugated and will not end there. Ukraine's neighbors will be threatened. All of Europe will be threatened. In their hour of trial, the Allied forces of D-Day did their duty. Now the question for us is, in our hour of trial, will we do ours? This is simply ridiculous. European nations themselves are so unconcerned about the Russian threat that to this day, many of them are not meeting their own targets 
Remember, that was uh, decided upon back in, what, 2014, to spend 2% of their GDP on defense. Now, under these circumstances, Biden's speech comes across as just irresponsibly fear-mongering that could actually end up with our getting into a nuclear war with the former Soviet Union, especially the fact that now Biden has authorized that Ukraine can use American weapons to fire into Russia. Are American weapons being used right now inside Russia? They're authorized to be used in proximity to the border. We're not authorizing strikes 200 miles into Russia. We're not authorizing strikes on Moscow, on the Kremlin. Oh, thanks. Remember the 200-mile rule now. That, that's, that's no problem at all. It's a cavalier attitude, given where this can lead, which Putin responded forcefully to yesterday. We are thinking that if they consider it possible to deliver such weapons to the combat zone to launch strikes on our territory and create problems for us, why don't we have the right to supply weapons of the same type to some regions of the world where they can be used to launch strikes on sensitive facilities of the countries that do it to Russia? The answer may be asymmetric. This is not good. And the bloodlust in Biden's remarks today is not going to help calm tensions. They've suffered tremendous losses in Russia. The numbers are staggering. 350,000 Russian troops dead or wounded. Nearly one million people have left Russia because they can no longer see a future in Russia. Contrast that celebration of the bloodshed in this conflict to Trump's call for peace five years ago at Normandy. What do you pray for when you pray for this country? Peace, really peace. And we built up our military, we built up our wealth, we built up everything. Our country is in such great shape right now. Iran is uh, in a much different position than they were two and a half years ago. Two and a half years ago, Iran was a disaster for us. Now they're, they've got problems, let's put it that way. They're not the same country. North Korea, no nuclear tests, I have a good deal. And we'll see what happens. We're going to see what happens. China wants to make a deal. Everybody wants to make a deal. We're the best, we're the strongest, there's nobody even close. Wow, what a change to today. And another big problem with Biden's remarks, his comments on democracy. We're living in a time when democracy is more at risk across the world than at any point since the end of World War II. Now we have to ask ourselves, will we stand against tyranny, against evil, against crushing brutality of the iron fist? Will we stand for freedom? Will we defend democracy? We stand together. My answer is yes, and only can be yes. This is nonsense. If we were truly worried about the fate of democracy, well, Biden himself would be laser focused on the rise of China, which is the only existential threat to democracy around the globe today with the power of China. Instead, his DOJ and his party are focused on putting their political opponents in jail. The entire Biden apparatus has it backwards. For them, it will be war through weakness. Divide the country at home, turn Americans against their constitution, their history, spend us into impossible debt levels, leave our southern border open, then ask Americans to sign up to defend Finland and Sweden against Russia? I'm not sure they're gonna like the answer our young people uh, give them about uh, fighting to serve that mission. By trying to draw parallels to Reagan, Biden's staff only underscores the extent to which the United States has declined over the past 40 years since Reagan's Pont de Hoc moment. You can ask yourself, is America stronger now than she was in 1984? No one believes this. It was moronic for them to ever make this comparison. Reagan won 49 states and 525 electoral votes in 1984. We think Biden's going to hit that mark, too. These are moments from today that our press will not show you. Biden confused upon arriving at the event. <laughs> Biden making sure he follows directions. You're not supposed to tell people that. Biden gets pulled back by Dr. Jill as Macron greets D-Day vets.
This is our commander in chief. If in a Biden second term, there is a realistic chance that American troops are going to be fighting Russian troops, then President Biden and the White House and the Pentagon, they need to be honest about this now. Listen closely to today's speech and to Blinken's aggressive remarks lately, and you can hear the war drums beating in the background. Biden was on the cliff today, but if he's going to push us over the cliff of war, we should all take that into account come election day. The evidence of sin's grip on this world is everywhere, and much of the suffering on earth is because of godless leadership, as we read in Proverbs 29.2. When the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice, but when a wicked man rules, the people groan. One day very soon, there will be no more elections, as our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, is returning. Revelation 19, 11-16 And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations, and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. He has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. The signs of Jesus' soon return are so strong now, and the evidence is so clear that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world as we know it is near. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. These are the ABCs of salvation. A. Admit that you're a sinner. B. Believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and God raised him from the dead. C. Call upon the name of the Lord, and you will be saved. Jesus paid the price for mankind's sin. He has provided a way to spend eternity with him and the Father. All you have to do is Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved. God has already done all the work. All you must do is receive, in faith, the salvation God offers. Fully trust in Jesus alone as the payment for your sins. Believe in Him, and you will not perish. God is offering you salvation as a gift. All you have to do is accept it. Jesus is the only way of salvation. That being said, we must repent of our sins. While repentance is not a work that earns salvation. Repentance unto salvation does result in works. It is impossible to truly and fully change your mind without that causing a change in action. In the Bible, repentance results in a change in behavior. Repentance, properly defined, is necessary for salvation. One day, Jesus is coming. You may be at church, you may be at work. You may be asleep. God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. My God, what if his appearance occurs on a Sunday morning? My prophetic word to you this morning is get ready, get ready! is short. Call upon the name of Jesus today.